Hi guys, and happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. My name is Alex Dietrich, and I'm a high school biology teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, but in my spare time, I am a Sundu fanatic, and I'm obsessed with the African species. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Drosera afra and a couple new species of Drosera from South Africa. It's like my third time recording this, so we're just going to go for it. Um, one take. <laughs> um, this is um, Hifbird Plateau. Uh, last July, my partner Jacob and I sold our cars and bought this cute little RAV4 in Cape Town, South Africa. We spent uh, from July until late January running around uh, taking photos of sundews for um, a book on African sundews that I'm working on. And as much as I'd like to show you every single cool plant that I saw on that trip, um, today I'm focusing on Drosera trinervia, Drosera afra, and a couple new species. So um, Drosera afra is an interesting species to me because um, it's really commonly grown in cultivation. Uh, it's been in cultivation since Debert introduced it. Paul Debert described this species in the early 2000s. And not too long after that, it was lumped back into Drosera trinervia, but having grown both species side by side myself, that's something that always confused me because they look so different, um, at least in the tiny snapshot of cultivation that I had. Um, so I knew you really had to go to see multiple populations over multiple time periods to really um, parse these two species out. So um, this is Drosera trinervia. It, this is on Table Mountain and Drosera trinervia is just a really common species everywhere you encounter it. Um, it's a so-called winter growing species. It can colonize areas that dry out during the hot summer um, and it dies down to a fleshy little root and reemerges with the winter rains. And so that kind of adaptation that a lot of South African species employ uh, allows this species to, to just be absolutely everywhere. Every roadside ditch, every mountain pass, every City Park is Drosera trinervia. Uh, these ones are growing uh, in the mountains near Yonkers Hook. And again, those, those three distinct veins are where it gets its name, Drosera trinervia. And those veins are um, a feature in every population of trinervia. Here are a group of plants work, uh, working, uh, growing in the Witsenberg in South Africa, um, in this kind of quartz gravel substrate. Most flowers are white, um, and they have these kind of fan-shaped stigmas. Here's some plants from the Cedarberg, a little bit more narrow of a leaf there in the Cedarberg, and deep red plants. Here's some Trinervia from Hifberg. Um, Again, those really strong, distinct veins. The plants on Hifberg are a little bit hairier than other populations I've noticed. Here's Rostra trinervia in the Klein River Mountains um, near Stanford. A big wedge-shaped leaf. Here is trinervia from the Northern Cape near Namaqua. Pretty big plants there in the Northern Cape. Here's a really typical form of Trinervia. Um, this is growing near Somerset West in the Western Cape on Helderberg. So small white flowers producing a ton of seeds, small bright red rosette. Here's the, the plants from Hifberg with their really tall scapes growing with some Utricularia bisquamata. Here's a plant on Helderberg growing in um, just about completely dry clay. So nearing the end of the season here. So most often white flowers, but um, you also get pink flowers in Drosera trinervia, um, sometimes side by side. So uh, here are these plants growing together on Matrusberg in the Hex River Mountains. There's no geographic trend with these 
pink flowers. They pretty much pop up everywhere. And here's Drosera afra. So uh, Debert described Drosera afra as having a distinct petiole, so a non-tentacle area of the leaf, um, as having reduced or um, not very distinct veins on the underside of the leaf, the trinervia have. Um, and particularly uh, this kind of dimorphic leaf habit where um, the leaves start off small in the beginning of the season and towards the end of the season, um, they're a lot more elongated. So these plants um, growing in the Whitsonbird in your series um, are quite early in the season. And here's the same group of plants uh, later in the season. So those first photos were taken in October. This is uh, towards the end of the trip in January. Um, so this is Drosera afra growing right with Drosera trinervia. Um, so Drosera afra with its really thin, long petioles, Drosera trinervia with hardly any petiole and those distinct three veins. Um, so I think this is the first time they've been photographed uh, together in one photo. Here's the flower of Drosera afra, um, always purple or pink. I've never seen a white flower Drosera afra. Same colored pollen as Trinervia, so uh, white to pale yellow pollen. And Debert described Drosera afra as having um, stigmas that are split into two parts here, so two groups of stigmatic tips. And I find that in most flowers, but um, not all flowers and not all stigmas on the flowers. These plants are growing on the Trusberg and the Hexruger Mountains. So again, you can see that split that he's talking about. Still in the Hexruger Mountains. Um, and yeah, you can see kind of the purpose of that petiole here in this photo. So um, that long petiole is a tried and true adaptation in a lot of sundews that grow uh, in and around the water. So we see it in Drosera anglica, in Capensis, Intermedia, where that petiole um, likely serves to hold that sticky lamina above the water so that it could catch insects. So you can see why that might give it a competitive edge over some other species in these uh, kind of wetter habitats. There's a good um, Debert afra flower with all its stigmas perfectly split. Still on Matrusburg here in the Hex River Mountains, always in these seasonal seepages. Here it is growing with a small form of Matricularia bisquamata. And here's the habitat. So um, this really incredible looking seepage. Um, this is the stuff carnivorous plant people dream about. Um, just the seasonal seepage. It's uh, fed by uh, snow melt. So Matrusburg gets a lot of snow in the winter and over the course of the year it melts and forms just uh, an incredible amount of habitat. So it's a really special place. This is at about 1800 meters um, in elevation. The trail starts at 1200 meters. And nearby, um, but not in the same microhabitat, Drosera afra grows with this incredible species, Drosera acolis. And um, this species has nothing to do with this talk, but I had to throw it in here because it's just such um, a cool species that's really rarely photographed. It grows on these really tall mountains that are miserable to climb. And its flower is just so unique. It sits just about on the rosette. Um, and the idea is that it uh, could be to help this flower stay intact in its habitat. So it grows in these um, open uh, dwarf alpine shrubs, uh, plains, and uh, it gets really windy and um, they get all kinds of harsh weather up there. And so this uh, allowing it to avoid getting banged up in the wind um, allows the flower to stay intact. But back to Afra. So here's Afra growing in the Witzenberg Mountains near Ceres. And this really sludgy um, overhang, really weird habitat for sundews. 
only getting light during some of the day and um, its seeds are, you can see getting deposited just directly in the sludge and seedlings are popping up, growing in pure sludge and just a super strange microhabitat. Um, here's some in a maybe more normal Afrohabitat, habitat, um, a kind of um, overhang with a seasonal stream. This is the Hex River Mountains in your series, um, further down the mountain chain uh, than Matrusburg. Lower in elevation as well, um, by about a thousand meters. And then this plant is a undescribed species um, that superficially looks pretty similar to Afra um, and also Drosera alba. Um, it has this dimorphic leaf habit. So where it gets these short leaves early in the season and these long narrow leaves uh, shortly after. So a lot like alba in that sense, these really glandular scapes, um, just one, uh, flower usually, sometimes two, rarely three. And it has a really unique microhabitat. So I visited uh, five populations of this species, and most often they're growing on these uh, vertical or really steep cliffs. And again, just those really narrow leaves towards the end of the season. Because of that cliff grown habit, I'd like to see this one described as Strasra cremnophila, cliff loving. Its flowers are really unique, so um, it didn't match any of the Afra I saw. So this bright yellow pollen and stigmas that are disc shaped, so um, not split at all. In that sense, it looks like it's likely most closely related to this little orange flowered species that's also undescribed. It also shares this yellow pollen and this, these disc-shaped stigmas. So these plants are growing in the Cedarburg, and I saw them in the Tratra Mountains as well. They have these huge fruit um, that are really round. The seeds are elongated, unlike Trinervia that has really round seeds. This is the typical habitat. So this is in the Cedarburg, and the new species is pretty localized in these uh, temporary seepages along these cliffs. Um, down further uh, the slope, you get Drosera afra, Capensis. Further up the slope, you get more Acolis. It's just a really gorgeous species. And this next species um, is another really gorgeous species, probably more gorgeous than any of them. Um, it's one that um, Henry Barnard um, brought to my attention. He found this, uh, Hendre's an undergraduate student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, and he's also a big sundew nerd. And he found this species in an herbarium and sent me a photo. And I said, oh, sorry, man, that's Strasera afra. Um, but when we finally met up, we went and saw this species and uh, we could tell it wasn't exactly afra. So um, here it is growing in almost pure sand. The leaves, uh, like Afra and the other one, um, start off really small early in the season. And as the season goes on, the leaves get bigger. There's some plants that are a little further along. So they just have these enormous paddle-shaped leaves. Um, of the three species, these plants were the biggest. So their diameter was about 12 centimeters or so. It's really impressive plants. And later in the season, um, we saw that they also have just really impressive flowers. So these bright, beautiful pink flowers, bright yellow pollen, some shallowly 
divided stig uh, stigmas and these reflexed petals. It's a really distinct plant. And they grow in just these huge colonies. It's really impressive to see. Um, probably the coolest thing about this species is just how dry the habitat is around um, the microhabitat where the species grows. So um, we're in the Swartruggins Mountains, um, which are pretty much uh, almost desert. Um, these plants are localized to a seasonal stream on this plateau. Um, and we haven't been able to locate any other populations. So they're only known from this uh, single stream at this point. By the time these things are flowering, the stream has all but dried up. The sand is only damp. It's just a really dry habitat. Here it is earlier in the year. Um, so a little bit of standing water in the stream. And here's the same group of plants, same part of the stream here um, later in the year. So the water is completely dried up there. And these plants will uh, bloom themselves to death. So they'll bloom right into the summer until uh, they've completely dried up. Um, all three of those species that we talked about, and Trinervia, who cares about that one, um, grow uh, at least some of their populations on um, protected land. So habitat destruction isn't their biggest threat, but um, I've noticed that a lot of these species are susceptible to climate change. So uh, this is a group of plants um, from a different population that um, unfortunately dried out before they could even flower. Um, this is an undescribed species with orange flowers um, that hopefully gets a name soon. And so you can see how reliant uh, these plants can be on these uh, seasonal precipitation and any change could be pretty ca catastrophic for these populations. And that's all I have for you. So again, happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. Um, I'm excited that there's so many people that are excited what I'm excited about. Um, it's a super cool hobby and I've met um, some really cool people. If you want to see more pictures of African sundews, um, if you're like me and just it's never enough, you can check out my website, africandrosser.com. And Hendre, um, who I said found that really cool uh, species with the bright pink flowers, um, his is capecarnivores.co.za. He has some awesome photos on that site. So uh, thanks, guys. Shoot me a message if you want to talk sundews. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.